Welcome to a discussion of radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, laissez-faire capitalism, and individual rights. The Yaron Brook Show starts now. Hey everybody, I uh, hope you're having a, um, a good Sunday. I don't know, anybody out there uh, actually watching, uh, watching football? Um, I don't know. You know, I'm not having a great Sunday. I, I, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. It's hard to be, it's hard to be positive right now, right? I mean, I'd love to watch football, but football's become so politicized in the last few weeks. Man, I was traveling all over Europe. Uh, some of you probably followed my travels through while this, uh, crazy, uh, NFL scandal has been going on. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it, it's everything today. It's, uh, I just open up the news, trying to prep for the show today. And there's, there's just nothing positive. And it's not just that it's all negative news, kind of used to that. It, you know, if, if, if it's always negative. That's what sells, right? What sells in the news is, is negative news. Nobody's interested in hearing anything good that's going on in the world. That's kind of boring, right? And that's our fault. That's us, the consumers. Of news, we we don't want to hear good news. We're interested in negative news, but I I don't know. I I've, I've tried to be kind of nice to to. Well, I haven't tried to be nice, but I've tried to be I've tried to be patient with this president. And and um, I don't know. Today it, it just it just I've had it. I've had it. You know this this tweeting, this absurdity, this vulgarity, the the the. the you know, he, it's so low, it's so unpresidential, it's so in the gutter. I mean, give me a break. The, the, the president of the United States needs to be tweeting about the NFL. The president of the United States needs to be tweeting about his view of the mayor of Puerto Rico, of, of San Juan in Puerto Rico. And then the president of the United States is undercutting his secretary of state in uh, tweeting about North Korea. I mean, it, 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 this administration is clueless. Put aside what they're doing. What they're doing is almost irrelevant because what makes the news daily is his tweets. And then, and then you have a media that again is, is completely clueless. That's it, it, so anti-Trump that all they obsess about are his tweets. And all they obsess about is, is proving him wrong and, and going after him. And, you know, I, I sympathize with that because he really is awful. But, um, but there's, there's stuff happening in the world. Good stuff, bad stuff, interesting stuff, stuff we should care about, stuff we shouldn't care about. There's things happening in the world. And yet, you know, when I look at the media and I try to figure out, okay, what is happening? Like in Puerto Rico, is, is Trump right? Is the mayor right? Is, is aid actually getting to, isn't it getting to the, you know, you can't even tell. You can't even tell them. There's no objective media out there. The media is so biased. It's so political. It's so tribal that you can't even get a sense of what's really happening in the world. So you've got a president who is, who is, you know, tribal to his core, who is non-objective, who is you're just rambling and angry and can't stand any criticism and is completely obsessed by his own image. And, and and defending that image. And you've got an, a, a, a media that completely mirrors that. And there's like, the world is insane. It's just, it's just nuts. It's just nuts. And then on top of that, you got, you got this nut, Ray Moore, uh, Roy Moore being elected to the Senate from the state of Alabama. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. You've got, um, North Korea, you know, again, it, it Tillerson saying one thing, the president saying another thing, all publicly, all kind of contradicting one another. Nobody seems to care. You've got uh, two terrorist attacks today, one in France and one in Canada. N nobody seems to care. Nobody has no any idea what to do about it. And it's like, yeah, okay, more terrorist attacks, more people dying. You know, more uh, uh, Al-Aqba and, and, and uh, you know, Islamist attacking um, – Attacking, uh, you know, passerbys in France, slitting a woman's throat, almost, almost decapitating her. And in Canada, somebody driving over some pedestrians. Nobody cares. You know, just go on. Oh, next weekend, there'll be another couple of terrorist attacks, just like there were a couple of weekends ago in England and in France again. And, and, and nobody cares. Just they go on as if, 
this is the new normal. There, there, there is, the, the world just seems like it's going nuts, it's just going nuts. And then, you know, in the midst of all this, the Republicans fail again, again, to repeal Obamacare or, or to they, they, repealing Obamacare was not even on the table, but to kind of modify it in a way that would maybe move us in a positive direction, maybe not even clear that would be have been the case. The the bill that failed uh, this week uh, didn't even make it to a vote because there was no point. You know, too many people were going to vote against it. And then and then you know the president of the United States saying, I think this was last week, um, saying, I, I'm not uh, I'm against repealing the Jones Act. I'm against uh, even suspending it for a while because the shipping companies would get mad at me. Oh my God! I mean, it used to be that cronyism was kind of under the table. It was hidden, but now we have a president who's actually proud of his cronyism, who, who's actually out in public defending his cronyism. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to do something that clearly is good, repealing the Jones Act, a, 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 an act, a, a ancient act that was protectionist, that protected the, the American shipping industry, uh, anti-competitive, anti-capitalist, anti-individualist, anti-market just just doesn't make any sense and there's an emergency where repealing it would would help but more importantly it should just be repealed it's just not it's just not a, an act that is consistent with america and and with markets and with what this country stands for i know the, 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 and the, and the, and the, you know the president doesn't even pretend that there's any good reason to keep the act he he basically says yeah the shipping industry would be would be mad at me would be mad at us. They they want it. So, you know, he's basically admitting that it's all about pressure group politics. It's all about, I mean, stuff we know. So you have to give him credit for at least being above board. This is exactly what's going on. But nobody cares. Again, nobody cares. They're much more, they, they care much more about his tweets about Puerto Rico and NFL than his nonsense about the Jones Act. And it, it, it you know, because nobody is for free markets in this country anymore. You didn't see the Republicans going, oh, no, you know, the, the, we really need to repeal this. There is a bill, by the way, in, in the Senate or in the House, I can't remember, I think in the Senate, to repeal the Jones Act. We'll see if it actually passes. Let's see if, if the fact that Republicans control the Senate and the House means anything good. Because so far, it's meant exactly nothing. So, um what what can I say? I'm I'm uh, I'm. It's just a it's just a depressing time to be an American. That's that's my view. Uh, you know, I'm I'm an immigrant, as many of you know. I came to this country believing I was coming to the freest country in the world, believing I was coming to the place where we had the most opportunities, and I was excited and, and still still am excited to live in the United States of America. But when I look around me. It, it, I'm excited and depressed all at the same time. It, it's it's just it just really is depressing. All right, so today we're going to take up this whole NFL kneeling, Trump responding, um, but just the NFL broadly because because Trump didn't just talk about the kneeling issue. He also talked about the hitting, right? Uh, how the game is played. He had commentary on that as well. We'll talk about that. I, I want to talk a little bit about Puerto Rico. Uh, and and the response and uh, the response and uh, again the tweeting back and forth between the mayor of Puerto Rico and and uh, President Trump and then you know North Korea North Korea is worth talking about a little bit uh, uh, talk about taxes the one thing Republicans have promised that they would get other than Obamacare which they've broken that promise that they promised about the taxes we should talk a little bit about the tax plan. The little we know about it, whether this is a good thing or not. And, and I'm interested in hearing from you. So, um, I, I'm curious. Are you watching football today? 888-900-3393. Are you watching football? Uh, if not, why not? Uh, is it because of, uh, of the kneeling? Is it because disrespect for the anthem? Is it because the game's boring? Is it because of the concussions? What, what is it that is causing you not to watch or, or are you just, you know, it's fun to watch. It's a hell with all that, and I'm watching anyway. So give us a call. Let us know, 888-900-3393. Are you watching football today? All right, you're listening to your own book show on the Blaze Radio Network, and we'll be back after this break. 
best-selling author, prolific media contributor, PhD in finance. This is the Yaron Brook Show, the Blaze Radio Network. Now, a moment to recognize an organization that is building the road to a free society. Founded in 1985, the Ayn Rand Institute's educational programs promote the principles of reason, rational self-interest, individualism, and laissez-faire capitalism. Since 2002, the Ayn Rand Institute has distributed almost 3 million copies of Ayn Rand's novels, including Atlas Shrugged, The Fountainhead, and Anthem, to over 60,000 teachers as part of their free books to teachers program. Additionally, the Ayn Rand Institute operates one of the largest essay contests in the world, offering high school and college students the opportunity to earn scholarships while advocating for free markets and individual rights. To learn more about the Ayn Rand Institute and how you can support this heroic mission, visit AynRand.org now. That's A-Y-N-R-A-N-D.org. listening to the Yaron Brook Show. All right, for those of you who uh, have been tracking my progress around the world, or not around the world, but through the world, I am on country number eight during this trip. Um, country number eight happens to be the United States of America, but I'm not home. I'm broadcasting today from New York City. And just to be positive for a moment, uh, New York is still a great city. Now, it has a crazy leftist, nutty Marxist mayor, and and I I I uh, fear that it is going to deteriorate, and it's not going to be anywhere near as as great of a city as it has been in the past because of that. But uh, you know, you walk around the streets, you can't really tell yet. Uh, at least I can't as a tourist, I guess that uh, they've got a Marxist mayor. Still, the skyline is still amazing. The lights are still amazing. Just the buzz and the energy and the excitement. Yesterday, yesterday we went to this. Uh, uh, a Japanese restaurant and you go into the basement of a building and in this basement they have they've really created an authentic like Japanese restaurant from Japan it you know you could have been somewhere in Japan and it, and it's just just the creativity the, the the ingenuity of the people um the food was fantastic uh you know generally the food here has been fantastic uh, on Thursday we had a big fundraising event for the Ayn Rand Institute here in New York and that went beautiful at the St. Regis Hotel, and on Wednesday, I actually did a debate at Yale, you know, the Ivy League school, Yale University, where I debated uh, the issue of inequality. It's a little scary, I have to say, because my opponent, uh, it, it was very smart and, and, and very sharp and very good, uh, but but his ideas are just horrible, and, and his ideas are mainstream, and I'm considered the crazy radical. I'm considered uh, uh, crazy because I defend capitalism. I'm considered crazy. Because I defend, uh, you know, your right to keep what you earn. And I, I, I defend the idea that people actually earn, that it's not luck, it's not, quote, privilege. I'll talk about that. I hate that word. I hate that word, privilege. As if, as if it's a, you know, you've been granted some special rights and special benefits because your parents, I don't know, your parents have worked hard and, and were innovative or productive and made a lot of money. And therefore you as a kid, you know, somehow carry with you some, some original sin of being born to loving, caring, uh, successful parents. And, and therefore you're privileged and you have to go around campus apologizing to everybody for that. So, um, you know, I was at Yale debating that. You got a little scared, uh, scary, but, but overall, I've been in New York for a week and I, you know, I love New York. I don't, I don't know that I could live here, but it's, um, it's just a buzz, the, the energy, the excitement. Yes, I know, I know it's, it's, it's very blue and, and it's very leftist and, and so on. But you know what? It's, it's like Silicon Valley a little bit. These are leftists that work hard. These are, you know, leftists that are actually incredibly productive. They're, 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 they're innovative. They make a lot of money. These are rich leftists. That's kind of the funny part about it, right? Um, and, uh, 
So it's 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 a it's still a pretty amazing place. It's still a pretty amazing place. Uh, Silicon Alley, Wall Street, the, the museums, the the great restaurants, uh, everything else, just just fantastic. So um, you know that's that's the positive. So while I'm I'm a little depressed by looking at the news today and and over the last week, I have to say I enjoy coming to New York and, and spending time here uh, when I can, and, it, and it's 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 amazing to me. That over the last few weeks we've done uh, shows for, for for you on the Blaze from uh, Baku, Azerbaijan, from Geneva in Switzerland, and and now from New York. And uh, l- last week you had a pre-taped show. Uh, and by the way, I, I should mention the fact that my new book is out, um, Moral Defense of Finance. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, and uh, you know I encourage everybody to buy the book and everybody to. Uh, to get yourself a copy. I think you'll really enjoy it if you're listening to the show. In Pursuit of Wealth, The Moral Case for Finance with my co-author, Don Watkins. So In Pursuit of Wealth, The Moral Case for Finance. It's right here. And, uh, yep, please uh, please go get yourself a copy. And um, and I hope... I hope that everybody, uh, everybody buys it and, and that, that, you know, that improve my mood. I, I'll definitely, I'll definitely be in a, in a better mood if you guys all buy, buy the book and, and drive its rating up on, on Amazon. And after you read the book, what would be really good is if you wrote a good review. So, so New York's been good. And I have to say, I, I, I came to New York from Kiev and, uh, you know, meeting young people in places that have it even like a million times harder than we do, as much as I complain. It's still America, still the greatest place to live. As much as I complain, uh, our political system is still, I hate to say this, oh my God, I hate to say this, but our political system is still relatively sane, relatively uncorrupt. Uh, when you, when, when you're in a place like Ukraine where, where, you know, the, the politicians are literally stealing the money, uh, and, uh, and where everything's corrupt and everything's crony and everything's falling apart. Uh, and you meet people, young people who are trying to, to fight that and trying to make a difference and trying to improve their lives. You kind of get an appreciation for what we have here. So, I, I, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying really hard to, to mitigate my, uh, my negativity today with some, some positive aspects. All right. New York is pretty good and we're in better shape than, uh, than Ukraine. How about that for, uh, for uh, good news, huh? All right. So. Talk about football quickly, uh, and 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 I want to talk about two aspects of uh, of of the issue with football. We'll, we'll we'll talk about the taking the knee after the break that we're coming up uh, towards. But but I want to talk about another issue that is that is uh, you know pretty pretty upsetting in my view. Uh, this is comments that Donald Trump made about football uh, at at the rally he had in Alabama about a week ago before the election of uh, Roy Moore. And he says the NFL ratings are down massively. Now, the number one reason happens to be they like watching what's happening with yours truly. They like what's, well, I don't even know what that means. They like what's happening because, you know, today, if you hit too hard, 15 yards, throw him out of the game. And they said they're ruining the game. That's what they want to do. They want to hit. They want to hit. It's hurting the game. So, so what's he complaining about? Donald Trump, the president of the United States, is complaining that football is not violent enough, that football is trying to protect its players. How dare they try to protect their players, right? And, and uh, you know, we have discovered over the last few years that football is incredibly damaging to the health of these players, that they are getting brain damage. And one of the reasons I don't enjoy football, watching football anymore is that every time one of those hits happen, I think – this person's brain is being damaged. I don't want to watch a sport in which people are actually destroying themselves. And yet, the president of the United States is celebrating. They hit, hit them hard. We, you know, maybe we shouldn't wear, be wearing helmets at all. Maybe we should just, you know, uh, go back to gladiators and start slaughtering each other in, in the stadiums. I find that so offensive. I find that so upsetting. All right. You're listening to the Iran Book Show. Uh, we're coming up to, to a break here. And when we come back, we'll be talking about taking a knee and football and uh, the rest of the bad news in the paper today. We'll be right back. You're on Brock on the Blaze Radio Network. The 
Yaron Brook Show. All right, we're back. And, uh, you know, before the break, I talked about the fact that uh, Trump is complaining that uh, he's nostalgic to, for the old days where, where in a football field, you know, there were no limitations on how hard you could hit and and uh, sending players back after concussions and, uh, you know, when men were real men and they actually brutally assaulted one another. And, and, and you know, that, that would, be, would be fine if not for the massive amount of, of evidence that has accumulated over the last few years about the brain damage and about the physical damage that has been caused to these players and how, you know, and, and, and the damage that happens to them very quickly afterwards. And it's just terrific to me that the President of the United States would be celebrating uh, you know, th- that aspect of the game, the aspect of the game that is so destructive to human life, that aspect of the game that is so, uh, that is so horrible. I mean, it makes it hard for me to watch football. I, I, I enjoy the game. I like the game. But one of the things that really makes it hard for me to watch the game is the idea that every time one of these guys gets hit like that, um, you know, they're really doing damage to themselves. They're really doing damage to themselves. This isn't fun anymore when it becomes like that. I, I Unless I add, you know, somebody mentioned in one of the chats here that, that the fact that all these stadiums, you know, there are two teams now in Los Angeles and all these stadiums that they're, they're getting hundreds of millions of dollars from from local government, from state government to, to finance these stadiums. That, that just, you know, but that's true of all these sports, baseball and basketball. The, the amount of taxpayer money going to facilitate entertainment to facilitate sport to, to you know when these should be and they are incredibly profitable businesses why are they taking out tax money you know you, you want to build a stadium build a stadium don't ask for my money for to do it so just like i i hate it when i hate tesla because tesla is a car that is built on tax subsidies I find all these sports stadiums and all these sports teams that are built in tax subsidies just as offensive and, and just upsetting. All right, let's let's get to the to the to this kneeling issue and um, the whole everything that's happened around this. And uh, you know, it's it, it, it's 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 such a mess in my view. It's 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 such a disaster the way this has played out. So. Colin Kaepernick, uh, the quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers last year, he no longer plays football for any team. Um, in the preseason last year, uh, did not stand up for the national anthem. He sat on the bench and then uh, nobody noticed for a while. And then when somebody noticed and, and put it up online, people started, uh, people started, uh, debating this. He actually got out there and actually took a knee. And when asked why he was doing this, took a knee during the national anthem and during the, and, and when people asked him why he was doing this, he said it was in protest for police brutality and what he viewed as systemic racism that, uh, was, uh, that was reflected in the police shootings, uh, that happened last year and in kind of the, the, the response to those police shootings and the fact that the, the police, even in some cases where, where it looked pretty nasty seemed to always get off scot-free and he he viewed this as as uh, as problematic in the country a real problem and he wanted to express his uh his dissatisfaction with this by taking a knee now it happens that colin kaepernick is 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 more political than that that it's not just an issue of, of police brutality i mean he he's been seen with che Guevara, uh che Guevara shirt uh, che Guevara was, was an awful commie and, and responsible for the deaths of I don't know how many people and, uh, and, and, and a real nasty, nasty, horrible human being. And, uh, Kaepernick is, is, is a, is quite radical left, it, it would appear, um, from everything else. But, you know, on the issue of police brutality, I, I don't think it was completely wacky. I don't think it's completely nuts. To protest that, to bring attention to it, to, to say, look, there's something going on here. And, uh, we should get some data and we should, we should actually find out, is there something systemic or not? I did a whole show. You can find it on one of my podcasts in the past on the shootings uh, last year. Um, and one way to get attention is to, is to, is to kneel at, at, at I guess, when the national anthem. Now, the response to this was pretty, you know, was pretty uh, obviously harsh, and 
I sympathize with the response as well because, look, the national anthem represents this country. It represents America. It represents America at its best. It represents what America stands for. It represents the spirit, the idea of liberty, the idea of individualism and individual freedom. And to disrespect the national anthem is is to disrespect the ideal of America, not just America today, the ideal of America. So I sympathize with Kaepernick wanting to get attention, and he has every right. He has a, he has every right to do so. Uh, I sympathize with the fact that the uh, that the ownership of the uh, San Francisco 49ers let him do it. I mean, he's a contract player. They could have fired him. They could have. I don't know what his contract says. I don't know if they could have fired him, but they they could have uh, come out against him, but they didn't. Partially because you have to remember, San Francisco is a pretty uh, left leaning city, and it's not clear that the fans uh, who they would have supported if uh, if uh, if the management had come down on Colin Kaepernick. Uh, but uh, you know, Kaepernick clearly said that he, he he believes this is a country that oppresses black people, and that's the essential, the essence of the country. And I disagree with that. I think he's wrong. Uh, although I think. There's a real problem in this country. I, I do think there's way too much racism in this country, and I think there are problems certainly in, in its history, but even in its presence with regard to racism. But I, I think, you know, I think that I, I think we can disagree about that, right? Kaepernick wanted to do it, fine, right? You can say, I disagree with Colin Kaepernick, and it's up to the 49ers management to decide whether to fire him or not. It's a private business. It's not a public institution. It's nothing to do with politics. It's all about, it's all about, uh, it, 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 it's all about, you know, the fans and the, and the private business and, and, and what they, what they do with this. Now, um, you know, this was going on all last August and, and into September and, uh, during the, at the time, uh, Trump, which was a candidate for president, be, uh, tweeted uh, that that Kaepernick should find a country that works better for him. You know, I don't think a presidential candidate should have gotten in the middle of this. I don't think it's that important. I don't think anybody should have paid too much attention to it. I think if we hadn't paid a lot of attention to it, it would have just gone away, uh, and uh, and it would have it would have disappeared, right? And, and the fans, some fans, were sort of objected, and maybe fans of the 49ers. I'm a fan of the 49ers. I've never liked Kaepernick. I, I've never liked his attitude. I never liked the way he played quarterback. I never liked. I don't. I just don't like the guy. But uh, they would have just walked away from it, right? So, uh, but instead, this became a national issue. It became a national issue partially because Donald Trump chose to make it a national issue. It became a national issue because the media chose to focus on it and make a big deal out of it. And it became a national issue. And and slowly, it wasn't just Kaepernick, right? Slowly. Other people started doing it. Uh, in Seattle, they started taking a knee, uh, some of the players, and became a, a bigger and bigger issue. And, and, you know, it's not an issue of constitutional right because it's, 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 it's a private venue. It's a private sport. It's a private facility. You know, again, if, if the owners of the 49ers said, we don't want you to do this, um, if, if they had a contractual right to say that, given the contract they have with Kaepernick, that's their issue. This is not about the Constitution, uh, as long as Donald Trump doesn't make it about the Constitution, as long as Don Donald Trump doesn't say you're banned and you cannot do this. And, of course, this is the danger of a president commenting on this, that it could be interpreted as the government is citing against taking a knee and the government is going to enforce that. Now, it hasn't gotten to that yet, but it could. And, and that's the real danger. All right, uh, a lot more to say about this, and uh, we will be back to say it. And also to take a call. We've got a call, at least one call. We've got a call from uh, Hong Kong. Now, you know, Arjun, Arjun from Hong Kong, stay on the line. I, I, you know, you want to talk about something a little different, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play out the football thing, and then, and then we're going to come back to you and, and take your call. All right, you're listening to your own book show on the Blaze Radio Network, and we'll be back. After this break, best selling author, prolific media contributor, PhD in finance. This is the Yaron Brook Show, the Blaze Radio Network.
I see. Here's my point. I I dislike Kaepernick immensely, and I find his kneeling during the anthem, uh, 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 you know, not a good thing. I, th- you know, he's not a good spokesman for whatever cause there is. And and uh, but I I think the issue he brings up is a valid issue. I think the whole issue of policing and the whole issue of shootings, uh, some of the shootings were just absurd and ridiculous, and and uh, and and you know, I'd like I'd love to bring the light of objectivity. On, on the whole question of policing and the whole question of police shootings. Kaepernick was not doing that. And, um, I have an immense respect for the country. So I, I, I think that, that, uh, y- you know, if you, if you feel like the country is betraying you, and I think Kaepernick feels that, then sure, you, you kneel, kneel, but suffer the consequences. And the consequence in this case, he has already suffered. That is, the consequence of his kneeling was the fact that uh, once he lost his job with the 49ers or wasn't renewed, and I think that was going to happen anyway, he just wasn't that good of a quarterback, and, and he didn't fit into the the new scheme of the new coach at the with the 49ers. But nobody else would hire him, and, and there's no question in my mind that nobody else hired him because he was just too controversial. He, he was... He was focusing attention on the wrong things. And this is an entertainment. This is a sport. This is not about politics. And he was causing people to focus on the wrong things. And therefore, he wasn't hired. And, and he paid. So he paid the price. Now, again, whether they were right to not hire him or not, that's a business decision. Um, and the fact is that a lot of people who watch football don't want this distraction and, and, and don't want, uh, you know, don't want to have to uh, think about politics when they're engaged in sports. It's not part of this, again, as the media. Because the fact is, the football games, usually the broadcasting of football starts after the national anthem is played. So mostly on television, we don't even see the national anthem. But, of course, because of the controversy, suddenly all the networks are being showing the national anthem and focusing in on this issue, which has made it a bigger and bigger and bigger issue. And And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I don't really care what athletes and what celebrities think about the political situation, about things that are going on in politics. Yeah, yeah, I don't believe, I don't believe it's that important. But what is important? What I think is important is is what the president says. And when the president goes on tirades against the players and against the owners in almost borderline threatening language, that I think is scary. I mean, you could say that they are wrong as a president. You could say that they're wrong. You could say that, they, you know, this country is not racist. You could say that, no, if you look at the evidence, you know, the police do this and this and this, and, and factually these people are wrong. Uh, but what the president has been doing is is an implied, implicit, underlying threat, plus the, just the language he uses and the way he does it. I find just so offensive and so ridiculous and so unrestrained and so undignified that it just belittles the presidency and belittles the country. I mean, you want to stand up for what America represents? Great. Say it's unfortunate that people are taking a knee to the national anthem because this is what the national anthem represents. The national anthem is about what America should be and can be, what we strive to make it. And, uh, you know, we should all be united in striving to make this country a country with no racism, a country that is completely free. And to the extent that there's racism out there, that's a bad, evil thing. And it's unfortunate that, that some people, some people, uh, these athletes or whatever still think that. And, and, uh, you know, make it turn it into a positive, a positive in terms of what this country really represents and what the country's for. Instead, it comes out as this, as this tirade, uh, against, against the owners, against the teams, against the players, and, and, a, 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 again, a, a kind of a false sense of patriotism, no matter what. You should never kneel in front of, what if, what if there's really something wrong in the country? And not just by the government. What if there's really something wrong in the country? What if you really believe that racism is prevalent in the country? Wouldn't you then be legitimate to take a kneel? A knee? Wouldn't it then be legitimate to 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 protest against the 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 flag and the and the and the uh, the anthem? So it's it, just the way this is all handled. 
it, you know, the president's wrong. I don't like the people taking the knee. I, I think they're all wrong. And, and of course, the people taking the knee, it's not just about racism. If it was just about racism, all right, we could, we could at least have a discussion about racism. But it's our whole leftist agenda. It has to do with what they, you know, they talk about the privilege. They talk about, uh, inequality. They talk about our whole leftist, uh, agenda that is motivating, uh, them. Uh, you know, th- so this is a, a knee against the essential liberty and essential freedom and essential capitalism that this country represents. And, and that's just sad. That's sad. And again, it's sad that we do not have a president who can still, and Obama was the same because Obama, Obama kind of didn't have a position, but nobody can actually defend what America is about. So nobody can actually make a commentary about this issue as president, as the leader that makes any sense. Um, all right. Uh, we're about to, uh, we're coming up here against a hard break. Uh, so you're listening to Iran Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network. We're going to take this caller from Hong Kong when we come back uh, in a few minutes. Welcome to a discussion of radical fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, laissez-faire capitalism, and individual rights. The Yaron Brook Show starts now. All right, so we're talking about this whole football thing and the kneeling and, uh, and everything to do with that. And, um, but more broadly, I want to talk not just about that, but, 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 but about, about, about Donald Trump's whole approach to governing and and how this relates to that but but if you're interested in i i'm curious are, are, are you watching football today are, are, are you boycotting football 888-900-3393 888-900-3393 if you have an opinion about this i mean my view is to some extent i, I don't really care that much right if if um if my team starts taking a knee and 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 i think that's disrespectful and i think that's wrong then i'll stop watching them Right. If your team does it, then write a letter to the owner and complain and tell them you're not going to support the team anymore. Stop going to the game. But this is not a political issue. This is an issue that needs to be solved among us. And when the president of the United States gets involved in the way he gets involved by almost threatening owners. And we're talking about even, uh, you know, people who, uh, who are supporters of Donald Trump. I mean, the, 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 certainly the, owner craft of the uh, New England Patriots is a big supporter of, and a friend, a close friend of Donald Trump, and he disagrees with Donald Trump. And and we could we could have a discussion about whether the owners are tolerating this because they don't have a backbone or because they uh, because they uh, are too politically correct or, or all of this stuff. That's all interesting, but it should all be happening outside of kind of the president of the United States going on on a tantrum about this. So uh I don't know. I I mean I'm not watching football primarily because I you know this this whole concussion thing and the the hitting and so on and I'm finding the the game uh you know more and more offensive because of that. But I'm curious, are, are, are you watching is 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 the kneeling thing preventing you from watching? Is this is this a major does this have a major impact on your life? I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that. It, you know, if, if you want to talk about it, 888-900-3393. And, and let me say that this pattern about Donald Trump getting involved and the way he behaves and in his tweets and just the language and, you know, that manifests itself in this Puerto Rico thing. Right. Now, I think, again, I, I think the mayor of San Juan in Puerto Rico is whining. I mean, oh, you got to help us with that. I mean, Get a spine. Nobody owes you anything. And, and go deal with the problems. And, uh, yeah, it's very difficult to get supplies to Puerto Rico. And you guys have, you guys on this island have destroyed it. And, and the infrastructure doesn't exist. And that's nobody else's fault, primarily, but yours. Now, you can blame the U.S. government for certain things. Why isn't Puerto Rico a state, for example? Three and a half million people and it's not a state. Um, why? Uh, why do we have the Jones Act, which has crippled the Puerto Rican economy for decades, decades? And, and there are lots of other things the U.S. federal government has done bad vis-a-vis Puerto Rico. But 
But, uh, you know, we don't owe, you know, it's, it's, it's not, you know, it's a problem because once you have FEMA and FEMA goes out and helps everybody, then, uh, why not help the Puerto Ricans? If it's going to help anybody, everybody, you know, what about, what about the people in Puerto Rico? Are they, why are they different? Why, why shouldn't they get as much support as everybody else? So there is that, but I'm, you know, I don't buy this whole FEMA thing about this idea that the federal government needs to step in and help everybody. I think that's a violation of the role of government and that these communities needs to be as self-sufficient as they can be. And this idea of sitting back and moaning and complaining it, it is just wrong. And I don't know what's actually going on in the ground there in terms of how FEMA is helping and how it compares to Houston. And there's certainly no reason the federal government should discriminate from one state to another. But, of course, Puerto Rico is not exactly a state, not exactly there. And that's all problematic. But why Donald Trump has to take this on and get into an argument over Twitter with the mayor of, of Puerto Rico? You know, why this all has to happen over Twitter, why it has to be so disrespectful, why it has to happen in this kind of language, in this kind of disrespect. It just belittles the presidency, it belittles the office, it belittles America, it belittles what we stand for. And and this is what I think Trump does. It's like you can't say anything against him because if you do, you, you know, you trigger him. And he just goes, he just goes ballistic. And, and it's, it's so depressing to have a president who has no self-esteem, who can't take any criticism. And, 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 and it becomes personal immediately. He has to attack the mayor personally. You know, say she's wrong. You, you know, provide some, you know, some kind of principal defense. Send your people out like they did today. Uh, on, on the news shows uh, describing what is actually being done for Puerto Rico. But to personalize it and to, to attack her the way he did, you know, it, it's just, I, I don't know. I, I, I find it just upsetting and offensive and, and, and bizarre. All right, well, I'm going to take this caller because we've been having on the line for quite a while now, uh, Ajun from uh, Hong Kong. Uh, hey, Ajun, uh, what's up? Oh, hello. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, before I get to the topic I called in for, I mean, you mentioned that you, you don't watch the NFL as much, uh, as, bef- uh, as much as before because of the uh, injuries yep. uh, or, or the um, dangerous nature. But uh, I was wondering, that, like, what do you think about uh, the fact that like, um, maybe that's the only way they can get to do such an extreme, you know, spectacular sport with such high performance and achievements like... Well, um, it, it, like it, it, so, so uh, as Jun is asking, you know, what if the only way to to do such a sport and it was such achievements and such spectacle is this way is where people really get injured? And I'd say, all right, you have a right to do it, but I'm not going to watch it because I'm not interested in watching achievements that involved destroying I mean, the rest uh, of your to, life. I I, 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 I think ask, I, I think that's wrong. I mean, to ask in, in, term of your, in terms of your hierarchy of values, I mean... I, mean, I don't see how, how you can have a hierarchy of values should, if you take your life seriously. I don't see how you can have a hierarchy of values that says, like, I am going to have... Maybe they love football so passionately that they, they, want it, they don't mind... Then I say that's, a, this, that's an anti-life hierarchy of values. You have to take the perspective. Mm-hmm. A hierarchy of values has to take into perspective. Uh, your, the fact that you're going to live to be 80 or 90... The, the, the fact that you want a high quality of life, the fact that your brain, your mind is the most important thing that you have and that, you know, you, you can't get so much thrill. It's the same as taking drugs, right? I, I get such a high from playing football. I don't care about the fact that my rational capacity is being destroyed. That is not a legitimate rational hierarchy of values. Not every hierarchy of values is legitimate. That's, that's what, you know, Ayn Rand teaches us is that you have to take your life seriously, which means you have to take your mind seriously, and you have to take your mind and your life seriously over a lifetime, and you have to project it over a lifetime, and you have to think about what's going to be good for you over a lifetime, and and doing something when you're young that is clearly going to destroy your life later on in life is just irrational and therefore inappropriate and wrong. Well, I would never play, or not to say that I can, but I I I wouldn't play for that reason. 
Well, I agree with you, and and but but I, I wouldn't support other people playing, even if they have decided for rational reasons what they want to do. I wouldn't watch it, or, or you know, and I'm I'm thinking about not watching it because I, I don't want to support that kind of behavior, that kind of irrationality. Maybe I don't know the extent of the injuries because you, you, you your mind sounds very made up on it. Like it's, as if it's, it's almost the as evidence bad as, today is that it's as, pretty. Um, it's the, you know, the injuries like are pretty narcotics bad. Narcotics and stuff, really bad. Almost. All right. Bad. Why don't we go to your to your question because we're gonna have to take a break here soon. Yeah. Uh, so my question is is about you know your comment recently at, at, in, in uh, England about the Japanese internment. Uh, I, I'm not sure I understood you correctly, but you said it was kind of justified or. Uh, no, I actually don't think the Japanese internment during World War II is justified. I, I don't. I think there were probably other ways to deal with it. I, I do think that it w- was justified during World War II not to take immigrants from Japan and not to take immigrants from, from Nazi Germany. Oh, okay. oh, and I, I think that was I the totally context in which that, I said yeah. if you declared war on, on, um, on jihadism and you declared war on specific countries that were responsible for the jihadism, it would be appropriate then – to, in a sense, uh, ban immigration from particular countries. But as long as we don't declare war, it's hard to, to have such a policy. Oh, sorry. Right? And one small point in Puerto Rico. Um, I believe that they don't pay personal federal personal income tax. Now, I'm not sure how... No, that's not true. Uh, so Puerto Ricans do... The decision of the government, but um, I understand the, that's the case. Puerto Ricans... Puerto no, Rico. that's not true. Puerto Ricans do pay taxes. It's, it's the Puerto Rico and the federal, the U.S. federal government have cut a deal... Where um, Americans moving to Puerto Rico uh, get assigned a specific status, where those Americans moving to Puerto Rico do not pay capital gains taxes and they don't do not pay other taxes, and in a sense they don't pay federal federal taxes. So uh, Puerto Rico turns out to be the only tax haven, only real tax haven that Americans can take advantage of, um, and that's a deal that the Puerto Rican government has has has, has done with the okay. uh, with the government of the United States. So even among the territories, okay. Uh, it's the best deal among all the all the territories. Puerto Rico is the best tax deal okay. among all the U.S. territories. If you're an American citizen, there's no place on earth better from the perspective on taxes than to live in Puerto Rico. Oh, yeah, because the income taxes follow you around in any country. Exactly, uh, except in Puerto Rico. And if, if you're an American who – if you're an, if from, the, from the mainland American move to Puerto Rico, then you get the advantages. If you're Puerto Rican – you don't get those advantages, so it's, it's okay. So it's, sorry about that. Then uh, yep, I got that yep, wrong. Yep. Uh, thank All you. Right. Uh, for taking Thanks. My time. Thanks for the call. Thanks for listening. Really appreciate it. And uh, we're gonna have to take a break now. So you're listening to your Run Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network, and we'll be right back. PhD author, media contributor. This is the Yaron Brook Show, the Blaze Radio Network. is the Yaron Brook Show. All right, so we're talking today about uh, Donald Trump's tweeting, I guess. That's what it's boiling down to because, you know, while I I find, you know, I don't like the idea of football players kneeling, I like the idea of Donald Trump's tweets even less. And uh, while I don't like the idea of uh, of, a, of a mayor of Puerto Rico, of, of San Juan Puerto Rico kind of begging and, and, and whining and complaining – um, and, and I generally, you know, I'm not a big fan of FEMA and, and massive federal support for everything. Although, again, Puerto Rico is kind of being screwed by, by the U.S. government for many, many decades. But, um, I, I like, again, the, the tweets of our president even less, the fact that he engages in all this. And let me just make a, a, a final, just a final quick comment on, on, I guess, uh, Donald Trump and tweeting. And that's, the tweet today about uh, Tillerson. So uh, Tillerson said yesterday that uh, there were direct um, negotiations between the United States and North Korea, that he was directly engaged in negotiations with the Koreans. That was direct communication. Now, I think that's a huge mistake. I think it's stupid. I think I think it's failed every time it's being attempted in the past. I think the United States should not be 
we should never negotiate with evil regimes. I think that's true of North Korea. I don't think we should negotiate with Iran. I, I, I think, I think we should do what's in our self-interest. And I don't think it's in our self-interest to negotiate with evil that you can't believe a word they say. So what are you negotiating exactly? They lie through their teeth. That's the only principle by which they can abide by. There, there, there is nothing else they can do. That's what evil does. It lies. It deceives. So I am against the United States having direct talks with, and, and I was very disappointed in, in Tillerson and that the, that the, uh, that the State Department has direct conversations with. I think only bad things are going to come from that. All right. But I also think that if you're president of the United States and you're running administration, you should have some control over that. That is, there should be no direct conversation between the State Department and North Korea unless the president has approved it. This is a big foreign policy issue, and you'd think the president of the United States would have a handle on this issue. And he wouldn't let his State Department go run amok all by itself, independent of him. But that's what it seems like is going on, because the president this morning tweets... Oh, no, we shouldn't be talking directly to the North Koreans. It's futile. It's useless. We shouldn't be doing it, which I agree with. But, but, come on. <laughs> you, you, you know, bring Tillis into your office and yell at him. You know, tell him to stop it. But you don't air your dirty laundry in public. You don't show the world that you have lost control over your own administration. But that's what Donald Trump is reflecting, that he has no control over his administration that the state department is is doing whatever they want and donald trump objects to what they're doing over twitter not by firing tillerson not by going over there and yelling at somebody maybe that maybe he's doing that as well but on twitter it just it, it kind of shows pathetic he is and he doesn't even realize that by tweeting it it shows how pathetic he is it, it's just unbelievable to me that the president of the United States uses Twitter to communicate with his own staff. I mean, he did this months ago, or weeks ago, with, with Jeff Sessions. He doesn't like his uh, Justice Department, uh, you know, Secretary of Justice. He goes to Twitter to criticize him. I mean, if you don't like it, fire him or, or, or try to change his mind. But what are you what are you tweeting about it? What are you letting the world know about the, the fact that you – a, a lousy manager who can manage your own administration, who has people working for you doing the opposite of what you think should be done. It, it's just, I just find the whole thing bizarre. I just find the whole thing bizarre. So uh, anyway, I don't know. I, I, I got up with all these, all these, all these uh, Trump tweets are just, are just getting me depressed. That's <laughs> that's all I can say. It's um, it's just so low. I mean, I have I, I love this country and I, I love those, what this country represents. And, yeah, I, you know, I know some people are going to kneel in front of the national anthem and that's bad. You know, in 1968, in 1968, uh, in the Olympics, during the national anthem, and these are these are athletes representing the United States. They they took off their shoes to and, 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 and were standing on the podium. Uh, with the national anthem in their socks to protest against poverty and they and they uh raised their fist with a black glove on it uh in in a salute of the black panthers of black power to protest racism in the united states and they they, they took a stand okay you know they i i think i i i wouldn't support that i think it's wrong but you know the world did not end as a consequence of that you know you 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 People, people express their views. We're not always going to disagree. The left in this country is, is dominant, particularly among blacks, which I think is sad because I think the left has stabbed black Americans in the back, that the left is, is destroyed. Uh, the black family, the left in its policies have, de have destroyed the capacity of blacks to, to, uh, to, to advance economically. They've institutionalized them into poverty. They've, the war on poverty has made, uh, is reduced the rate at which blacks uh, move into the middle class. So it's sad that, that so many of them are leftists, but they are. And they take a knee. Okay, you know, get over it. Move on. It, 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 it's sad, but, but, but then 
once the president gets involved, it makes it a big issue. It m- turns it into a big deal. And now you've got whole teams protesting, not protesting a, on the issue, protesting the involvement of the president of the United States in this thing. And and now, you know, everybody's out there talking about Puerto Rico because the president has raised this issue. And, 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 and uh, of course, he is demonstrating through Twitter – his complete and utter lack of ability to manage his own people, his own administration. So j- just incompetence, and uh, and uh, I, and it's sad because I have a huge amount of respect for this country and for the presidency as representative of this country. All right, when we come back, I want to talk about something other than negative. You know, the, the election of Roy Moore, which I think is horrific. Uh, and then we'll 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 uh, we'll talk. We've got a few other issues, and of course, you can call in and, and, and disagree with me. You're listening to the Iran Book Show on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be right back. You won't hear traditional political views here. This is the Iran Book on the Blaze Radio Network. Show. All right. Uh, well, we're back, and we are talking about, well, we're talking about all the pressing news of the day. I'm sorry. You know, I, I, I and it's, it's, I'm, st- I still believe in this country. I still believe in, in the fundamental values of this country, which are the values of individualism and the values of liberty and freedom and individual liberty and individual freedom. And yet, the last couple of presidents, or the last three presidents, have just slowly eroded uh, the, everything about, uh, you know, what's good about this country. And it really is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And, and I think Trump is taking us to a new place in that respect, a, a new low. And, and, and really, one of the new lows was, was I thought, the election of Roy Moore, this... Um, this last week, he won the primary in Alabama, will become probably, most likely, the senator from Alabama uh, to replace Jeff Sessions. Now, Jeff Sessions is not my favorite guy uh, because, and, and many of you know, I think, Blaze listeners, that, that I'm a, I am an atheist, and I do not believe that religion has any role in government, that, that religion should be a factor in decision-making in government. I believe that this country was basically set up as a secular government, as a government that is there to protect individual rights. That's it, to protect the individual. The government is supposed to protect us from crooks and criminals, not from natural disasters even, from crooks and criminals and fraudsters and terrorists. That would be good if our government did something to protect us from terrorists. And from foreign invaders. And other, other than that, you know, arbitrate disputes. We need a legal system. But other than that, leave us alone. I think, for example, disaster relief should be privatized. I think, for example, most of what the government does today, probably 80% of what the government does today, maybe if you take into account state and local, I'd say 90% of what the government does today, the government shouldn't be doing. And it should certainly have a separation from, from, from church, from religious issues. It's not the government's job. You, you want to be religious, that's fine. You want to have any religion, that's fine. It's not the government's place to dictate what our religion should be. It's not the government's place to, to, to claim that it's founded on religious principles because it's not. There is no such thing as individual rights in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Or, 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 or it's, those are, that's a philosophical concept. That's a secular concept. That's the concept on which this country was founded. And here you have a guy, Roy Moore, who does not believe in the separation of church and state at all, who insists that the laws of the of the United States of America should be based on religious principles. Who has certain religious beliefs? That's fine. He can have them. That's his right. I think the. But he doesn't get to impose those religious beliefs, and yet has a history of imposing them. Whether it's the Ten Commandments and insisting on having the Ten Commandments in a courtroom, even when the courts have ruled against it and said he has to 
take it out. He had to be literally kicked out of the court by a judicial ethics panel. Because he violated, he refused to abide by court decisions. How can you have a judge who refuses to abide by court decisions? Refuses to accept the rule of law. There's nothing more fundamental in a free society than the rule of law. And yet, here's a judge and now a senator who does not believe in the rule of law. That's just horrific. Just horrific. Then, that was the Ten Commandments thing, and then he defied federal law regarding same-sex marriage. You can disagree with the ruling about same-sex marriage, but it is the law of the land. And as a judge, you have to abide by it. As a public official, you have to abide by the rulings, agree or disagree. Imagine if every public official in the United States said, I agree with those decisions of the Supreme Court, but I don't agree with other ones. And I'm going to, therefore, only follow the ones that I agree with. Imagine if every public official, not just uh, uh, judges, but but police officers, you know, police officers, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't agree with the... Uh, you know, with, with, with half of, of the laws on the books. I'm only gonna follow the ones that I, uh, I, I like. Right? So, it, it's, it's, it truly is, it truly is, uh, insanity. Insanity. So, you can't have that. That would be complete chaos, complete anarchy, complete violence, complete, complete breakdown of any civilization. And here is a judge. Who did that? So he not only did he say he, he, he disagreed with the same set language laws, but then he told he told the county clerks not to abide by them. He directed Alabama probate judges to ignore the Supreme Court. <laughs> and now he's a US senator. He got rewarded for that. The, the 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 voters, the Republican voters of Alabama, rewarded this nut. This person who does not believe in the rule of law, who does not believe that you follow the rulings of the court, of the Supreme Court. And they rewarded him by electing him to the Senate. I mean, to me, it, it, it's just unthinkable. And, and it's, again, depressing, <laughs> depressing that this is where the country is. This is the kind of people the country elects and, and who supported Ray Moore, who pushed him, in this case it wasn't Trump, the, the voters actually went against Trump and his candidate. This was Bannon. You remember Bannon who used to be Trump's chief strategist and the chairman of Breitbart, Breitbart uh, I was going to say entertainment, it is entertainment because it's certainly not news. And, you know, Bannon was pushing this guy. And, and and Bannon is going to get involved in, in many of the primaries. He's going to have his own list of candidates. And these are the kind of candidates Bannon wants, who don't believe in the separation of church and state, who don't believe in abiding by Supreme Court. Uh, I mean, imagine if, if, if liberal judges decided the Supreme Court was irrelevant and then conservative judges decided the Supreme Court was irrelevant. The country would fall apart. But that's what Bannon wants. Bannon would love to see that. Because at the end of the day, what he wants is 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 a, a strong man at the top of the federal government ignoring the Supreme Court and dictating what should happen. This is how you get authoritarianism. This is how you head towards authoritarian government is when you start ignoring the courts, when the rule of law completely and utterly starts breaking down. And Roy Moore is one step, one more step towards exactly that, towards the, 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 the end of uh, of American government as we know it. Now, I, you know, I don't want to sound hysterical, but but this guy is really bad, really bad. Now we still have a robust system of government that will probably protect us from his shenanigans. You know, Moore was a like Trump <laughs> was a shameless peddler of the of the birther thing, right? Obama is a birther, you know that conspiracy theory. Um. He, he he just comes up with stuff, you know, he makes stuff up. He is a post-truth candidate, post-facts candidate. So in that sense, he, he's very much like Trump. And it scares me that we're getting more candidates like Trump. It scares me that that's the direction the country's heading in. All right. 
We are going to take a uh, quick break here. You're listening to your Ron Brooks show on the Blaze Radio Network. We'll be right back for the final segment. Israeli military veteran and radical for capitalism. It's the Yaron Brooks Show on the Blaze Radio Network. Yaron Brooks. Hey, so we're, we're talking about a bunch of different stuff. I guess I'm depressed today, so it's it's not being the most uh, positive and uh, and uh, exciting show. But maybe maybe Dave Dave and I again can uh, can uh, get me on a better track. Hey, Dave, how's it going? Hi, good, you're on. Thank you. And yourself? Well, you I, told me not so good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. What's up? Uh, my question is, it might be kind of subtle, but. Uh, just a moment ago, and I've heard other people say this, you were saying that you support both liberty and freedom. And is there a difference, or uh, I wonder if you could talk about that. Okay, so Dave's asking, is there a difference between freedom and liberty? Why do we use two different terms? And, you know, there is, I think it's a subtle difference. Um, I, I think the first thing to 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 ask is freedom. What, is, what does freedom mean? Right? Freedom from what? And what I mean when I talk about freedom is freedom from coercion, freedom from force, freedom from authority, freedom from other people telling me what I can and cannot do, what I can and cannot think. Uh, freedom is, I think, the broader concept. It's about the absence of coercion. Freedom is living a life where you're free of coercion. And, and we're not very free in America today because because of the way we're taxed, because of uh, of the way we're regulated, because of the degree to which government controls us. And government is coercion. Government is force. Government is authority. I think liberty means, relates more to the mind. It relates more to thinking and speaking and writing. It relates more to issues surrounding the First Amendment, I think. Uh, so, so liberty is more, uh, you know, be freed from authority. Um, you know, I, so that's my understanding. I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm not saying. I'm not. This is not my definitive statement of the topic. So uh, you're gonna have to forgive me for not having. Uh, uh, you know, for not having it completely down. Does that make sense? Yes, it's uh, great food for thought. So when when the founding fathers say uh, y- we have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The right to life is it includes all other rights in a sense. The right to life is basically the the, the right to pursue the actions necessary to, to live your own life. To to be f- the right to life is the, the the freedom from coercion in every aspect of your life. And then they articulate and in the original draft, I think they they mention uh, uh, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness. And and liberty relates to thought and to the products of thinking. Property relates to economic activity, obviously, and um, material activity. So so liberty relates to kind of the, 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 the product of the mind. Property more relates to kind of the material world. And the pursuit of happiness is more like the, the ultimate goal for all this, uh, you know, acting in a way that ultimately leads to, to happiness. So that's how I think about it. Um, but I, I'll, I'll give it some more thought and see if I have a better, more definitive answer in, uh, for, uh, sometime in the future. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Great. thanks for okay. calling. Thanks, thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to just say something about why I think things, are, you know, there are a lot of reasons why I think things are bad and why I think things are getting worse, but, but I want to focus on one issue, which I, I'm going to spend a whole show, um, one of these weeks on, which is I think we're deteriorating into a, a form of tribalism in this country. And, uh, you know, there's my tribe and there's their tribe. And uh, everything is is based on emotion. It's not based on fact, which is, which is what tribalism exactly uh, is. It's an expression of emotion. We're gravitating towards the tribe that looks the most like us. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's the kind of the, the, the racial animosity that is developing in this country and is, is, ex, is being exacerbated, I think, right now from both sides. And again, I'm not saying it's from any one side. It's on all sides. I think when we stop, when we stop, uh, being, um, convinced of the efficacy of reason, 
when we stop being thinking beings, when we don't teach our kids how to think but how to emote, when our students are trained in uh, postmodernism, then uh, all we're left with is emotion. And when we just have emotion, you know, we're looking for a group to support us because knowledge is impossible. Uh, emotions cannot lead us to knowledge. So we're looking for a group, and, and uh, there's one group that that is taking a knee, and, and there's another group that opposes them, and we, we latch on to one of those groups, and, and we can't think in terms of, in terms of any, any kind of subtleties. You know, the good guys and the bad guys, there's my group and there's their group, and that's it. That's it. And I'm not saying there's no right or wrong. There clearly is right or wrong, true and false. But that isn't the standard anymore. There's them versus us. You know, some survey found that something like 60% of all the people who voted for Trump would basically support him no matter what he did and no matter what he said. They're a tribe. They're Trump's tribe. And they will follow him no matter what he does. And then there's the leftist tribe. That, that, and there's the media. That no matter what Trump does and no matter what Republicans do, if you will, they're wrong, they're evil, they're bad. No matter what capitalism results in. It's wrong, it's evil, or bad. It's not based on facts. It's not based on evidence. It's not based on science. It's not based on reason. It's all based on emotion. It's 100% emotion. It's my tribe versus your tribe. My group versus your group. And, and unfortunately, that's where we are today. We, we have lost what really makes America, America. What makes America, America is individualism. That we treat the individual as an individual. And we respect an individual as an individual, not as a member of any tribe. And we treat arguments as arguments, true or false. We evaluate them, right or wrong. Not based on the color of the skin of the person advocating for those ideas. Not based on his party affiliation. Not based on where he lives or what he looks like. But based on the truth or falsehood of his ideas. It's about facts. It's about evidence. It's about truth. It's about reality. And that, that I, I am afraid is slipping away from us and, 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 and America in that sense is slipping away from us. This is the land of reason. This is the land of truth and facts based argument. This is the land of individualism. And when we lose that, we lose what is America. We lose what America stands for. And unfortunately, we've got a president who's playing to the tribal instinct, to the pri tribal aspect and uh, you know it's terrific it's sad and it's uh, and, and we got to overcome it all right you're listening to your own book show where we stand for reason and individualism uh, go read Ayn Rand go buy my new book uh, we'll talk to you next week bye you're listening to the Yaron Brooks show on the blaze radio network